Hello, everyone. Arif Tov. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. If I see you, I don't see you. Thanks for coming as well. The youngest member here is Ben Kahan from Fridelia. I'm really excited about that. This is going to be great. Okay, thank you all. Let's give it, I don't know, let's give it two or three minutes. Talk amongst yourselves, talk to your family members. Nice to see faculty members here. Thank you for joining. I, I figured it was his mom, but I wasn't sure. Nice to see faculty members here. There's going to be some repeating on some of the stuff that we learned uh, earlier this month, but okay. I warned you and hopefully it will hopefully it will work. Maybe you didn't listen the first time. Someone just told me Ben will know everything. So okay, let's get Ben on. Okay. So your kids can come on if they're around, if they're interested. It's not past their bedtime, eight o'clock. Tomorrow's Friday, the week's almost over. Everyone's invited. His lights are out. <laughs> I'm not going to quote her, but she said Ben will know everything. Any quote? That's because he gets a good night's sleep. Clearly. Okay, nice to see everyone. Sorry, I'm just going to give everyone, you know. 8.05, we'll do an 8.05 start, and we're gonna go for an 8.45 finish. Um, that's just to, just to set expectations for, for all of us, and hopefully I will, uh, I will live up to that. Prime Minister of Israel spoke in the United Nations today. Anybody hear it? I didn't. Shana Tova, Debbie, to you. Shana Tova. Okay. Oh, one more minute. 805. 805. <clears throat> can you hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me and your camera's on. Sorry for the background noise in my house, but relatively, relatively calm. Today was the 11th day of our school year, or 12th. Somebody just asked me, I think I said we're at 6%. Is it 8.05? It's not 8.05. Adina, make me start at 8.05. Okay, it's 8.05. Can I go? Okay, thank you all um, for being here. I hear a little bit of an echo, so I hope it's not too bad. Um, this is uh, this is new for me. Um, I haven't given a, a pre-Rosh Hashanah shir. My father, who, who um, I miss every day, um, wanted me to be a rabbi, so he probably wanted me to give more formal, formal, Rush out, um, but, but that's not exactly the business I went into. Although it, I guess I guess pretty close, um, but it's an opportunity to gather without gathering to use the venue that we've uh, that we've come to. I don't know, love or hate or or, or live with and appreciate um, to be able to learn some Torah tonight, and and I really do appreciate the the time that you're taking to do that to connect with you um, for two reasons. First of all, because we're, we're a community and we can learn Torah together as a community, which is a value that is always relevant. Second of all, because Rosh Hashanah um, is a time for reflection. And third of all, because I wanted to introduce the theme of our year, um, which resonates with me, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I was trying to, I was hoping to be able to connect those things. And I think that if we're successful in the theme of our year, um, it won't be just something that happens within the walls or no walls of our school, um, but it will be something that um, is, is part of the communal conversation. 
um, because I think it's important. And I think that we all think it's important. And, and hopefully some of what I say will resonate with you. Um, please, please feel free uh, to comment in the chat. That's probably the, probably the best way um, for us to have some kind of conversation here. Um, and again, I'd love to uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say as I'm speaking um, and to be able to reflect on that. I want to start with a question. Um, Hayom Harat Olam. The words that we say on Rosh Hashanah that we're going to say beginning Sunday night, Monday. Hayom Harat Olam. Today is the birthday of the world. Today the world was created. We all know that Rosh Hashanah is about celebrating, although some people don't describe Rosh Hashanah as a day of celebration, but it's a day of certainly commemorating and um, noting and mining, minding the fact that the world was created on Rosh Hashanah. And yet there's a famous Gemara, or I was told to say a classic Gemara, maybe it's not famous, but it's a classic Gemara that talks about a machloka, Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Yeshua. But when was the world created? So Rabbi Eliezer says, but Tishrei nivra ola. So, okay, the world was created in Tishrei. And therefore, every Tishrei, we kind of get together to talk about what the, world, what the meaning of the world is, what the meaning of life is, whether we're doing our job in this world, etc. But interestingly, there's another opinion. And the second opinion is that, according to Rabbi Yoshua, b'nisan nivra ha'olam. The world was actually not created in Tishrei. The world was created in Nisan, on the first day of the month of Nisan, the same month as we celebrate Pesach. So they go back and forth. Who's right? Was the world created in Nisan? Was the world created in Tishrei? Which is an interesting intellectual argument. But the obvious question is, both Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Yeshua know, because it's clear in the Torah, that Rosh Hashanah is, the, is this week. Nobody thinks that Rosh Hashanah is in Nisan. So even Rabbi Yeshua, who says that the world was created in Nisan, he doesn't disagree about this holiday. And the question is, well, if if the world was created in Nisan, so what happened now? And what are we doing now? And what's Tishrei all about? With your permission, I'm going to actually ask you to ignore that question for, for a while, and we're going to come back to it at the end. Why, according to Rabbi Yoshua, are we celebrating the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the new year, when the world wasn't created? It was created six months from now, or six months ago, however you want to calculate it. So let's talk about our theme. We, we, we've had a theme of the year at SAR for, I think, 14 years, as I told our teachers, some of the learning that we're doing, much of the learning that we're doing tonight is some things that I shared with our teachers when I introduced the theme a few weeks ago. Um, it's a nice thing. It's a nice thing to kind of focus on something different every year. We started with Israel at 60. Um, so around 14 years ago, we started with the theme of the year being Israel at 60. As I said to our teachers, some themes were more memorable than others. Maybe some themes were more successful than others. When What we try to do my daughter here? Holy cow. Hannah Krause is here for me, Rochelle. I am. Thank you for I joining. I just chatted her. I was like, are you in Israel? <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. Go to sleep. I heard right. you she's, really she's, good she's, shirt. she's up early for sleep. Thanks for learning with me, babe. Wow. Nice. Okay. Yeah. That's really nice. Okay. You made my night. Um, sometimes the theme is the theme is more successful than than others. Um, I think our teachers really like good choices, good choices and deeds and voices. It was a good slogan. It made sense. It was, it was something that you could connect to lots of different things from the beginning of the day till the end of the day. Um, but we always try to have a theme of the year. Last year was Shemitah. I would say one of the more forced themes, important, um, but certainly not natural in terms of, you know, if you're thinking of a cycle of your themes of the year, you don't necessarily think of Shemitah as part of that cycle, but we thought it was an important thing to learn. This summer, as I was thinking, as we were thinking about what the theme would be for this year, um, something came into my head and I uh, worked with a team of student activities um, personnel, student activities members, Adina among them who's here, um, that work on a lot of our programming. And I said, you know what, would you consider Kavana, would you consider mindfulness as a the theme of our year? It's something that I've been thinking about a lot, quite honestly. Um, it's an area where I, I think I have a lot to uh, to grow. Um, I, I have I, I have some legitimate excuses and some less legitimate excuses. I have a job which puts me in a lot of different places in a building where there are a lot of things coming at you at the same time. Um, but I have found, um, like I think many of us have found, that um, it's hard to focus. And I have found that some of my conversations have been less, um, I guess, productive or fruitful or 
just you don't you don't come out of those conversations feeling good when you're half in a conversation and half out. And I thought that maybe this is something that we can work on as a community. Being more mindful when we're multitasking, when there's so much going on, when there's so much coming at us, can we can we consider this as a theme of the year? And that, and and they agreed, and we talked about it. I wanted it to be not just a, I guess what we would call a, a, a secular topic, but I wanted there to be some some kind of Jewish content. So I thought, what, what would the Hebrew word for mindfulness be? Dina Shaftal is one of our Hebrew teachers from teachers from Israel. Um, told me that the, technically the word is kshivut or hakshava, right? To listen, to listen with a certain level of intent. So we could have gone that way. But I thought that kavana for me resonated more. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about what these things, what these things mean and what we're trying to do. So I looked up the definition of mindfulness, the way we all look things up these days, the same, that same source of multitasking, the, uh, the, the, the computer or the phone where we can look up what things mean. And I found a couple of definitions. The, uh, the American uh, Psychological Association defines it as a moment-to-moment -moment awareness of one's experience without judgment. In this sense, mindfulness is a state and not a trait. It might be promoted by certain practices or activities, such as meditation. Other people talked about the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. A lot of the definitions um, kind of revolved around that. Somehow being mindful is connected with being non-judgmental, which I thought, which I found to be, which I found to be really interesting. Somehow, when you're mindful, you you might be more open to people's positive traits. Um, when you have a mindful conversation that you're told when you're having a conversation, sometimes people, and I've done this, I do this all the time. When the other person's talking, I'm already preparing my response, right? So I'm not really being mindful of what the person's saying because I'm already thinking about how I'm gonna formulate when I'm responding to that person. But that's a little judgmental because it basically means that whatever you say, I know what you're gonna say, but I'm really more interested in what I'm gonna say. So mindfulness, the connection between mindfulness and 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 being non-judgmental, whether it's of things or generally of people, I think is an important thing. Mindfulness means maintaining a moment by moment awareness of our thoughts, feelings, sensations, and surrounding environment through a gentle nurturing lens. So it's a certain level of kind of like awareness or what's what we might call leaning in, right? I'm, yeah, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling confused. And then there's something that might be freeing, you know, liberating about that because you actually own it and you recognize it. So mindfulness could be could be a positive trait um, in that respect because it allows you to own the things that you're feeling as opposed to just feel maybe not so good about some of the things that you're feeling. And again, as I said before, some other people define it as involving acceptance, paying attention to our thoughts without judging them, without believing, for instance, that there's a right or a wrong way to think or feel. There might be a wrong way to do and a right way to do, um, but for the most part, and I think there are lots of proofs in our literature and in our liturgy and our halakha about this, that you're allowed to feel a lot. You're, you're pretty much, right, this is certainly in our religion, the focus is really on primarily what you do and not so much on what you think. Although again, mindfulness and kavana is actually the opposite in terms of focusing on your thoughts. But, but there's a certain acceptance of feelings um, which is connected to mindfulness as well. So I think we can agree um, you know, whether we think it's an overused buzzword or not, but I think we can agree that this concept of mindfulness is a, is a positive, it's a positive value. Um, you know, again, whether you're a self-help book person or not, whether you think you need to practice mindfulness in the ways that, that, you know, might be more popularized. Um, but certainly I think we can agree that it's a, it's a good thing to do. And I, and I think that we can mostly agree that it's become a harder thing to do. And not just for our kids, but also for our kids, and not only because of technology, but also because of technology. Um, and we thought, therefore, that it would be something that we can model, that we can learn about ourselves, and that we can focus on for our kids. Now let's talk about kavana, or kavana. Um, what is kavana? So of course you got to look in. You have to look in our in our in our sources, and there are lots of sources which reference kavana. The first one is a Mishnah where the last line of the Mishnah might be more well-known. But the Mishnah talks about stuff that we don't really focus on, talks about karbanot. Ne'amar bo'olat be'hema, Mishnah Manachos, ne'amar bo'olat be'hema yishay re'ach nitho'ach, uvalat of yishay re'ach nitho'ach, uvamincha yishay re'ach nitho'ach. So the Mishnah says that 
in the three different types of carbonate that were brought, whether it was an animal, which is a big carbon, whether it was a oaf, a bird, which is a smaller animal, obviously, or a carbon mincha, which was brought from flour, which is the least expensive for sure, the easiest, the least messy, I imagine. Um, for each of those carbonate, the Torah says, Ishei reach nichoach Hashem, that God's response or God's reaction to that korban is to say reach nichoach, it's a good smell. Now, again, we could spend a lot of time talking about what does God, God's enjoyment mean? How does, does God smell? How does it mean? But the point is that God's response to a person's korban was no different if that korban was a big cow or a small chicken or a little bit of flour, which probably cost about 50 cents. Echad ha-marbe, lomar lecha, says the Mishnah, echad ha-marbe ve-echad ha-mamit, uvad she-yechavein libo la shamayim. The Mishnah is telling us, the Mishnah teaches us, the Torah is telling us, that it doesn't matter how much you do. Echad ha-marbe, if you do a lot, or if you do a little, what Hashem cares about is your intent. Now that's a very, again, it's a, I think it's a very liberating thing. People, like, can you imagine how somebody feels if they see their friend bringing a olat beima to the base of Mikdash, right? They're bringing a big, expensive cow as their car, but to the base of Mikdash, and I'm in line right behind it with my mincha, with my, you know, with my flower. But if the Torah says, Ishei reach lihoach Hashem, that somehow his response is identical with the exact same words to each of those things, why? Because Hashem is telling us, even though it's a, it's a book that's centered on what we do, that you can do different things and get to the same place. Why? Because the, because the key is intent. Because the key is kavana. It's true that we have a law-centered environment. All right, I said it a few minutes ago. We don't really focus on just believing. It's not enough to just believe. We do have to do. But how we approach something, the intent that we have makes a big difference. Of course, the most famous, and maybe we should have started with this, the most common um, use of the word kavanah is in tefillah. Now, this is an interesting one, right? Because on one hand, tefillah below kavanah, kaguf belina shama, we're told that if you daven without kavanah, it's really nothing. It's just words, right? I mean, which, which, which is logical, right? If I read words that don't mean anything to me then I haven't done very much. So we're told that the, the way we do something matters. Although, again, I will tell you, and I think this is true, and I think this can be proven if we had more time, proven halakhically, that while we are told that kavana and davening is so important, there's a recognition time and again that it's actually pretty unattainable, or it's certainly not attainable on a regular basis. So they talk about a first shema. Do you have to have kavana for the first paragraph, for the first word, for the, for the whole two paragraphs, for shmona esrei, for parts of shmona esrei? And actually, if you look at davening, all of davening is leading up to the parts of davening that are important. Sorry for saying it that way, right? But that's really what it's about. The Hasidim or the Mishnah says in Bracha that the Hasidim how we show them how you show him show Achad, the early Hasidim would come to shul early. I, uh, I told the teachers, I, I'm, I was never used to coming to shul early. This is my year coming to shul early because I can't be late. Can't be late because Kaddish is at the beginning. Um, so I'm getting a little taste of what the Hasidim are showing we're doing. But that's the truth is, even if you don't come to shul early, you come to shul on time. And you go through Pesuket and Zimra. What's Pesuket and Zimra? Pesuket and Zimra is getting you in the mood for Shema. So Shema is, a, Shema is really, really important. Shema is a mitzvah. And then Tefillah. Tfila, tfila itself is actually, you know, maybe five minutes out of the 30, if we dive in chakras, right? That's the truth. Um, so kavana, of course, in tfila is so central. And technically, right, the, the, we're told if you, do, if you dive without kavana, it doesn't really mean very much. Although at the same time, we're certainly told, keep that routine. And we certainly tell kids, keep that routine. Because you know what? You're probably not going to get to the, the tfila with kavana. Um, if you just wait for it to, to show up. So you have to keep on davening and hope that the Kavanah comes. Um, but again, it's an example of the value of being mindful, of the value of actually stopping. Mincha is, mincha is the classic example, right? Mincha is, 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 is put where it is on purpose. You start your day, you end your day with davening, that's like one level, right? You stop in the middle of the day and you force yourself to stop in the middle of the day. And everybody, everybody that talks about mindfulness, anybody that talks about 
leading, leading a productive life, it talks about forcing yourself to make time for things that matter. Because if you don't, if you just wait for them to, you know, wait for yourself to have time, nobody, right? Nobody has time, right? They say, what do you, what do they say? Ask a busy person. Right? If you want to get something done, ask a busy person. That's what Tfilat Mincha is about. It's actually stopping in the middle of the day to say, I'm going to have a mindfulness moment. You know, when SAR, we dive with a Hitha Kedusha. It's a short Tfilat Mincha. But you try to stop in the middle of the day to say, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to get out of the rat race. I'm going to get out of running from class to class or from meeting to meeting, whatever I'm doing. And I'm going to be mindful of where I am. So I think the value of Sharon Richter said it to us at, uh, at our administrative meeting that Kavana, um, the word Kivun, right, is direction, right? Kavana you bring, brings your direction into your life, right? Doing things with being mindful of what you're doing, doing things with mindfulness brings a certain direction to your life, which actually makes you feel, um, which actually makes you feel fulfilled. Um, I spend, I'm actually doing it now. My eighth grade class, we learned the sugya, usually before Rosh Hashanah, we learned the sugya of mitzvot tzrichot kavana. All discussion as to whether a mitzvah counts with kavana or not. So on one hand, we happen to paskin for the most part, that mitzvot ain't tzrichot kavana. The halacha really is that, again, and I'm not going to call on Hannah because that's not so nice, three o'clock in the morning, but um, for the most part, if you do a mitzvah without kavana, you did it. Right. I blew the shofar. So, so I blew the shofar because I thought it was a, a nice music, but actually I blew the shofar. I ate the matzah because I was it was force fed to me, but I ate the matzah. So we usually pass kibitzvot ain't srichot kavana. But what the Gemara actually says is there are even levels of kavana. One level is you have to know what you're doing. If you have no idea what you're doing, that might not be enough. Second level of kavana is not just you know what you're doing, but you actually intend to do the mitzvah. Asher kiddushanah mitzvah. That's what a bracha is, right? I'm about to do this, not because I feel like sitting in the sukkah because it's nice outside, but I'm going into the sukkah because I shared Kiddushan of I'm declaring that I'm doing this with intent. I'm doing this with Kavanah. So the value of Kavanah is clear. I think that the fact that we pass in mitzvot ein srichot Kavanah is this recognition that nobody's going to be mindful all day. It's, it's almost like an aspirational thing. It's like a lofty goal. It's almost like the cycle of Rosh Hashanah, right? We end Yom Kippur and everyone says, how can we, right? If we end Yom Kippur, how can we have the calendar? Next year's Yom Kippur shouldn't even be on the calendar because hopefully we're not going to mess up. But there's an understanding that we will. There's an understanding that life is not perfect. Mindfulness is a value that we should aspire to and we shouldn't give up on and we should do better with and we should be mindful of. Um, and the same thing with Kavanah, but we're a little bit let off the hook with Mitzvot Tzrichot Kavanah because we actually are told, you know what, Mitzvot should have Kavanah, but if you do it without Kavanah, you're, you're going to get some credit. I, and I think that's an important part of this because if we, you know, if, if we take mindfulness or Kavanah as an all or nothing um, deal, we're probably going to, we're probably going to fall short. We're probably be frustrated with ourselves and we'll probably give up. Um, there's an amazing halakha, I share this with the teachers as well, there's an amazing halakha, which again, I think, teaches us the value of kavanah, but also um, teaches us a lot, and I think the application to kids in particular is very powerful. The halakha is, as you know, there are 39, 39 different types of work, 39 malachot that you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. One of those types of work is, is plowing, choresh, you're not allowed to plow your field. So the, the Ebrayta says, Rabbi Shimon Omer, Gorer Adam mitaki kaven lasot Person's allowed if he's outside and he's got, a, he's got a chair or he's got a bed or he's got a bench on the other side of his backyard. And he wants to bring it to the side, but it's too heavy, so he has to drag it. Gorer Adam mitaki sal. He can drag it from one side to the other. Even though it's going to be plowing his field, maybe not as neatly as he would have liked to, but it's going to be plowing his field on the way, as long as, as long as you're not trying to plow, as long as you're not intending to make a hole. It's Shabbos. One of the 39 things you're not allowed to do on Shabbos is to make a hole in the ground. So why should you be allowed to carry your chair from this part of the field to that part of the field when you're going to make the hole, 
So he says, because davar she'eno mitkave mutar. So think about this. It's a legal category now. Not only is kavana like a nice lofty goal, but actually we're being told that if a person does something but doesn't intend to do it, that in some respect, halachically, it didn't happen. Again, I see some teachers here now. I, I share this with the teachers because I remember, and I, you know, I guess I'm getting better maybe a little bit or, or used to certain things. My 18th year at SAR. It always happens in davening. I'm, I'm sitting there in davening, and I would say to a kid, okay, can you please stop talking? Okay, stop talking. I turn around. I come back 15 seconds later, and the kid's talking again. And then I say to him, you know, like, stop talking. And what do they say often? I wasn't talking. I'm watching Debbie. I'm watching Debbie's lip there. I wasn't talking. I used to get so frightened. Like, what are you talking? What are you, what are you, I would just watched you talk. Just own it. You were talking. And then I actually looked, look at this halakha. I'm like, they're right. They actually didn't intend to talk. They might not even know that they were talking. So what we just learned is that halakhically, they're a thousand percent right. Davar she'eno mikaveh mutar. So we're spending this whole time, and I think it's true, talking about the value of intent. The value of intent goes both ways. The value of intent, maybe we can apply this to our parenting as well. I meant to wake up. I intended to wake up. I didn't intend to come late. I didn't intend to hurt you. Again, at some point, we have, right, there are certain other halakha, right? If you hurt somebody, even if you didn't intend to hurt them, you're responsible for that. You have to, you have to learn that halakha too. But the concept of intent being so important that if you didn't intend to do something that you actually did, we consider it, you didn't do the malacha. That's a very, that's a very powerful thing. So we have this value of mindfulness in our own world. We have this value of kavanah in the halachic world, in the world of our, in, in the world of our literature. I think that they really come together. I think that if we try to recognize how hard it is, but try to recognize also how valuable it is, it can go a long way. Why? I think we started talking about it before. I think it can go a long way because it works. Anybody that's experienced a few moments of mindfulness knows that they feel better afterwards. And it's almost always true. As again, I'm... I, I keep on saying I share this with the teachers and I see some of them here. I think it's almost always true. You show up at a meeting, you don't even want to be there, but you're here. So either cancel it or like do it or like just do it. And if you do it, maybe make it a little shorter if you don't have that much to say. But whatever, seven minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes that you're giving it. If you just decide I'm going to be here, you come out of those 15 minutes feeling more rich, feeling more enriched than you do if you're like, Kind of half there because you have to be there. It's a fact. I think we all know it. Um, I had a friend in camp. I had a friend in camp when I was growing up who I used to wait for at the end of uh, Davni. He had a very long Shmona Esrei and he, um, he asked me to wait for him. It was, I walked the 13-year-old Davin Shmona Esrei every day for 30 minutes. And it was like mind-blowing to me. And then I realized that it wasn't just a Shemona Esther, it was actually the way, and, and it might have been in this case, to be honest, a little bit unhealthy because he wasn't always able to function, right? He was always late. He was always behind. But there was something amazing about the fact that whatever this person was doing, he was completely doing. I remember I, I once had, uh, I lived in Europe for, for a bunch of years, and the Italians take their food very seriously. And I remember I was speaking to an Italian friend of mine who said that, that if you're living in Italy and you have a hot pasta that comes out of the oven and your phone rings, nobody in the country will pick up their phone because I'm, I'm, my hot pasta just came out of the oven and that's what I'm doing and that's what I'm going to enjoy and that person on the phone can wait because I'm going to be mindful about my pasta. Now, again, Obviously, what you're choosing what to be mindful about, choosing when you need to actually stop doing what you're doing. We can always, you know, uh, ask important technical questions. But I think the concept of whatever we're choosing to do, interacting with our kids, learning Torah, doing a project at work, going through our emails, 
deciding that, okay, I'm doing it now. I'm going to try to do it fully. Having a conversation with somebody, having an interaction with a stranger, boarding a plane and talking to somebody next to you. Whatever I do, I'm going to try to do with Kavana. I think can make the world a, um, a richer place for all of us. And it's something, and again, I say this, I promise you, and <laughs> you know me, I, 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 this is not something that I easily live up to. Um, but I think, I think it matters. Uh, um, and I think it's something that we can do. I think it's something that we can do and we can do, um, and we can do well. Um, When we talked about the the value of kavana of, of mindfulness with our with our staff, so we talked about a couple of things. Obviously, interactions with students, right? Teachers teach students for many hours a day, but then there was times in between, right? Those times in between where you're seeing students outside of class, where you see them in the hallways, and paying attention to those things. And again, I would say this as parents as well. That's where a lot of the real stuff happens. That's where a lot of the real interactions happen. I spoke about our meetings, our own learning, right? Focus, finding, deciding we're going to carve out time for our own learning, whatever learning that is, and being mindful about that. Being mindful about our physical spaces, and people talk about this a lot. It's very hard to, to, to lead a focused life when, you're, when there's physical clutter around you, and trying to do that, and trying to um, model this for our kids, trying to um, intentionally talk about this with our with our students and with our children. Um, I think if we, if we can do it together as a community, it can make, can make a big difference. Um, creating a culture of trying not to rush as much for me. It's like, okay, you know what? If you, you can set yourself up to not rush, right? It, again, it doesn't always work, right? But we know how we feel when we're rushed and we know how it affects our day and we know how it affects our interactions. And trying to create a culture of not rushing with ourselves, with each other, with our students, um, would be a great place to be. I want to go back to the question that I started with. If you remember, if the world was created in Tishrei, we understand why we're celebrating Rosh Hashanah in a couple of days. But if the world was created in Nisan, so why does the Torah say to celebrate Rosh Hashanah in Tishrei? And the answer that's given always resonated with me is that Rabbi Yeshua says that even though I believe that the world was created in Nisan, but something really important happened on the first of Tishrei. The Tishrei, Be'echad Tishrei, Allah B'machshava. The world was created in Nisan. But you know what happened on the first of Tishrei? He made the decision. He came up with the idea. And what Rabbi Yeshua is saying is actually a really, really powerful statement. On the first of Nisan, you know what happened? Whatever this means, however this works, on the first of Nisan, of the world was created. The Asara Ma'amarot Nivra Olam. Like, that's a big deal. The world was created. But you know what happened on the first of Tishrei? Something more important. Someone or some being made a decision to create the world. And I guess what Rabbi Yeshua is saying is, if we need to commemorate one of those two times, I'll choose the first one, Allah Machshava, the board meeting, the decision. Because when did it all happen? It didn't happen when they started digging or they knocked down the building. Right? That's not, that was very important, obviously. That's the, that's the implementation. But when did this whole thing happen? The creation of the world happened in the moment of mindfulness. It happened at the moment of Kavanah. It happened at the moment of intent. When when God intended to do something big, why there was a six, I don't know why he needed six months that I can't, have, right? You could have decided and done it the next day. These are interesting questions. But that's a very powerful thing. The decisions that we make, that's the important things that happen. The actions that we do, those are the things that follow. But when did it click? When did I come up with the idea? When did I focus on this thing to come up with the idea? When, what's, what was the creativity of the creation of the world? It wasn't when it was created. That's just technical. That's just bringing out the crazy. It's important. But it happened when the idea came. That, to me, that is the center of the value of, of mindfulness. I think it's something that we, can, that we can learn a lot from. I think it's something that we can decide to do more of, I think it's something that we can tell our kids 
and we could share with our kids that we believe in. And we could probably be challenged by our kids. One of mine is looking at me and, and still awake. That, you know, it's something that we're going to sometimes, it's something that we're sometimes going to fall short on. But I think it will, it will, it will make us richer people and more fulfilled people. And it will give the experiences that we have um, meaning and purpose. Um, I think it's really actually the concept of Kedusha. Right? We, the word holy is a very abstract word. Kedusha is about separation, right? Hamavdil ben Kodesh lechol ben or lechosha. Kudusha is about taking all the noise in the world and kind of sifting it out and saying, this matters and this doesn't matter. Could you, could you think of a time in history where you needed to do more sifting of all the stuff that comes at you and figuring out what I'm going to focus on? I mean, it's, it's completely overwhelming, right? You could read every newspaper from, you know, from your phone on the train. You can read every piece of social media. There's so much, and, and there's a lot out there, by the way. It's not, it's not garbage. There's a lot of good out there. There's a lot of good material out there. There's a lot of good skills out there. There's a lot of good books out there. There's a lot of good ideas out there. And figuring out the concept of the show about how to take those things, sift through the noise, and make the moments that we have meaningful um, is a big challenge. Like I said before, the cycle of Elul basically it says two things. Number one, it says that we believe that people are ultimately good. If people weren't ultimately good, then we wouldn't be able to do tshuva because basically we go to God and we say, okay, that person that sinned yesterday or last week or last month or six months ago, that's not really me. The real me is coming before you today. That's, that's the whole concept of tshuva. That's the whole concept of hatarat and darim. Oh, the person that made that netter, that wasn't really me. I wasn't, it's not the real me. Now I'm, I'm coming to you as the real me. And that's why the tshuva is accepted. The flip side of that is that we know that we're not going to always make it. This cycle will continue. Now, you're not allowed to do it on purpose. It's the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, if you say I'm going to sin, but I know I have this tshuva trick, so it does, echtav ashuv doesn't work. But the concept of knowing that we have values, those values are important to us. We hope to get better every year. And we know that we're going to, you know, maybe bet 500, 700, right? Baseball 300 is a pretty good batting average. So we know that we're not going to always get it. Um, that's part of our reality as well. Um, and I think it's important thing. It's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, that's what I have to say. I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to share with you, but more importantly, I hope that we will be successful. Um, I've been very gratified by the, you know, teachers who have come over to me since we introduced the theme of the year. And they've said that they're actually thinking about it. They're actually modeling it. They're actually implementing it. They're actually putting, putting it into their classes into their interactions, into their meetings. That's a very gratifying thing to me. Um, I hope that we'll figure out ways of, of raising our consciousness and being mindful of our mindfulness with, with Kavanaugh, with intent, and with the intent of, of, uh, of just uh, enriching ourselves, enriching our kids, enriching the, the, the world around us. Um, thank you for your, uh, for your time and for your uh, participation, although this was somewhat passive by design, although I, I will just, uh, just for a minute or two. Anybody wants to share, I certainly don't want to don't want to hold anybody back. So please feel free, whether it's in the chat um, or if you have a comment to make or a question to ask, I would love to hear your voices if you are so inclined. Hannah, what do you think? Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Wishing you a Shana Tavak, Tivava Khatima Tava Shana Tayim Bishalom. We should just have a good, productive, and successful and mindful year for all of us. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening.